I think this is almost the full screen, no? Yeah. Are you using PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then in that itself, there is a full screen option. No, I've gone for the full screen. Okay, okay. At my end, it is showing full screen. So. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. 
Sorry, I got disconnected. Network problem. Hello, we no, start no. now. Yes, please. Maybe others will be joining. Okay. Okay. Very warm welcome to all of you to this uh, 28th distinguished lecture series being organized by INA Humanistar Chapter, Swa University. IIT Bhubaneswar, IMMT Bhubaneswar, and IEEE Bhubaneswar chapter. <laughs> I'm very happy to say at very short notice, Dr. Narayan Prasad Padhi, who is currently the MNIT Jaipur's director, and he is also an authority on power system engineering and SCDC smart grid. As a small introduction to him, of course, he doesn't need any such introduction. I must say, Dr. Padi received his degree in electrical engineering, masters in power system engineering and PhD, all from Gindi Engineering College, which is currently the Anna University. In the year 1990, 93 and 97 respectively, he worked in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Beats Pilani, and University of Ruki, now of course IIT Ruki, where he's a professor for the last 15 years, and he's on Leon to MNIT Jaipur as its director. Dr. Padi's contribution to the area of power system has been immense. Besides being author of four popular textbooks on power systems, and he is guiding 26 out of the 43 research scholars right now, he has authored more than 230 papers in international journals, including 38 in IEEE transaction, and with overall Google Scholar Index of 8,932, H Index of 48, and I Index of 132. So, friends, actually, as you know, it is customary to say a few words on uh, the sponsoring institutions to this uh, distinguished lecture series. Unfortunately, from SOA University, the two persons actually who used to be there, that is uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor P.K. Nanda, and Renu Sharma, both of them are actually in daily on certain say urgent work. Possibly, uh, they may join or may not join. So in view of that, I will also say a few words about this uh, SOA University. As you know, SOA became a, a deemed to be university in 2008. And in last 15 years, it has done really very well in all respect, in the sense that it is actually in as far as, as far NIRF ranking, they are in the category in 15th now in the whole university India in the university category. And in their medical, they are 21, they are dental, they are 10th, and they are, uh, you know, law, they are 9th. So these are actually very, very commendable. And so far as the engineering is concerned, they are 29th and overall they are 31. I think this is one of the best performing universities in the Eastern region, particularly the new among the new universities. And also it finds its rank in times high, higher education ranking. They are between 601 to 800. They also find a place in QS. Of course, 
in key ways, actually they are 1200 and above. So, but this is a very really <coughs> multidisciplinary university with presence, not only in engineering, but also in the management. Then, uh, then also it is present in a big way in medical, dental, nursing, pharmaceutical, law, hotel management, agriculture, and very recently it has added veterinary science. Hardly actually any private universities of this type that we have, and it has got about 16,000 students with about 1,500 faculty in different disciplines. So with this small introduction about this university, I request if uh, the director of uh, IIT Bhubaneswar or anybody from Bhubaneswar is present here to say a couple of words about IIT Bhubaneswar and similar request I will make for IMMT Bhubaneswar. Do we have actually Professor Karmalkar or somebody else actually from IIT Bhubaneswar? Possibly nobody is there. So, sir, from IMMT Bhubaneswar, the director of IMMT Bhubaneswar is he present? No, I don't. Uh, I don't actually see him. So now with these things, may I request actually Dr. Narayan Prasad Padi to make his presentation and uh, what, you can, what I will really request him that you please enlarge and make it actually full screen so that actually all of us could see very nicely. Otherwise, it is visible, but full screen will be better. Is it? Okay. Uh, is it please. Okay. Yes, so, it is visible. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Damodaraji, and uh, for uh, briefly introducing me. And it's a great opportunity and honor to be part of this family. And I will try my level best to uh, make all of you uh, understand a little bit about what I have contributed in the last one and a half decades. And it, it's basically a new story uh, how we get into renewable energy integration research. And some of my experience in the laboratory, I thought I'll try my level best to make you all appreciate what you've done as of now. I do have one more challenge that because we all belong to different fields, so I'll go very um, and kind of slow and simple way to make all of you understand what exactly the theme is. So thank you very much, sir. I'm audible, no? Loud and clear? Yeah. Yes, perfectly. You are audible. Thank you. So today is this is talk is empowering renewable energy integration, a smart grid initiative at IIT Roorkee. Uh, exactly, almost. Uh, in 2012, because prior to 2012, we were doing research in power system engineering, not on smart grid. The name was also kind of buzzword and nobody knew what exactly it is. So we also thought that let us also do something on smart grid. But to be very honest and frank, it is 2012 midnight. Probably the thought of the process of getting into smart grid research has evolved uh, in the same small laboratory where we thought uh, exactly the blackout become a bigger issue in this country. So we all knew that uh, 700 million people affected and there was a failure in load management and planning, lack of observation and coordination among the utilities, irregular maintenance and lack of monitoring and weak interregional corridors due to multiple outages. So as you could see that most of the country, most part of the country got affected during 30th and 31st and a reasonable amount also got affected, continued on 31st July 2012. So during the 2012 post-blackout era, 
the drive to work on smart energy grid and energy storage was sparked within the research group. The initial spark was that we had actually enough amount of renewable energy in the rooftop of each and every commercial, sorry, private buildings and government academic campuses. So in the at that time, actually, we had close to 1.73, uh, you know, megawatt of solar on the rooftops. But because of the blackout, we could not even switch on a small tube light in our residences, even having actually 1.73 megawatt of solar. That means when the grid is not there, then our renewable energy, whichever available to us, whichever the magnitude is available to us, they also stop generating because they do not see a grid functional. So renewable integration is an, an important issue to make sure that your grid is stable throughout the day, throughout the month, and throughout the year. So the challenge is having so much of renewable in this country today, most of the renewable energy may not produce energy during your emergency. So can we not get into a technology where even during blackout, at least those rooftop solar panels must cater the local energy during the major failures in the grid level. So that was the initial thought process. So I'll just give you a little bit of idea how where we are leading to and what are the challenges we all are going to face in next one decade. Now, as of today, the installed capacity of this country is close to 415 gigawatt. And out of which the solar energy contribution is close to 16%. But if you see almost excluding thermal, the rest of the clean energy is close to 50%. But over a period of time, when you grow in 2022-23 20, tentatives, we are expecting that the PV contribution, PV contribution over a period of time will move close to 6% in 2023 overall contribution as per the real power output. Means we have 16% installed capacity percentage and in the form of real energy contribution it is close to six percent but the scenario is going to change in 2030 <coughs> in 2023 age of today if you see solar and wind solar is actually keep on increasing and as you could see it is close to uh, 14 13 to 14 thousand megawatt installation and the percentage of contribution, as you could see, they are actually close to 50%, including small hydro generations. Now, this figure is very important to me because 21, 22, if you see the solar percentage that the yellow strip, which is almost uh, 50,000 megawatt today, but the future 2029, 20, 30, it is going to be 300,000 megawatt. So in next seven years, the solar installation will be sevenfold, which is very, very significant. So now you could see the strip which has gone from actually 50,000 megawatt to 300,000 megawatt in next seven years time. So when you have huge potential for solar and also integrated to the grid, then we have to make sure those solar PV panels or the solar energy parks must cater even during blackouts. And they have to be resilient enough to switch off off the grid and on the grid. Now let us get into a bit of challenges related to PV power generations. Many times I used to tell this statement and I wish to repeat it again. Unfortunately, God is not very kind to engineers. God has given us actually wind energy, which is available during midnight. God has given us solar energy, which is available during almost lunchtime. 
unfortunately all the three peaks of the day do not appear during the peak of pb or the peak of wind so that means we need to think how does pv energy available to me during a particular day of time need to be used during the peak requirement of this country now the peak if you see closely you know that is close to 8 to 10 pm evening peak that any power system in this country experience but unfortunately a lot of energy which is available to me during 7 am to 7 pm and majority of them are available at 1 pm and this is basically the percentage of pv integration but if you are penetrating up to 50% 10 20 30 40 50 up to 50% penetration the grid can easily observe all the energies during that hour but if it is 60 70 80 90 100% pv penetration that means most of the energy today available to me from pv uh, cannot or may not be able to get observed by my grid and hence this packet of actually load or the energy need to be shifted to the load area during 8 to 10 pm now if you see i mean what what we have done basically uh, if you go to this characteristic let me uh, simply take the upper portion beyond uh, beyond actually 50 percent penetration graph so you could see that the characteristic will now look like this so this is my pv curve and this is my standard load curve and there is a bit of overlapping and bit of disconnection also now what happens actually all the pv power being produced during this zone being consumed by the load and the pv power produced during this region will be observed by the grid and the excess PV power which is available to me not being observed by the consumers will be useful for my charging of batteries subject to I do have enough battery in the system to get it charged. So please remember that the battery is an important component which has been added to my network not by the choice but it is forced to have a battery in the system because during day peak if your renewable integration is keep on increasing then probably my grid is not going to observe because the load during 1 pm is not very significant and that amount of power i cannot sacrifice and perhaps i need to charge it and the same scenario continue for rest of the day so what exactly motivated me uh, to get into this area before a decade I mean, people were talking about reduction of global warming. And one important part of uh, is part of the challenge of this uh, power system of this country is peak energy deficit. Because in 10 years back, we had peak energy deficit of close to 2 to 3%. But slowly, I'm happy to say or happy to inform you that today, India as a country, we are not peak energy deficit power system. But sometimes, actually, we are having scarcity of power, maybe maximum up to 0 0.4 to 0.5%. Now, those peak deficits can be met by putting a lot of installations, new energy power stations. And if that is not possible, <coughs> then we need to shift the load to some of the off-peak hours by giving some incentive to the consumers. And whereas that is available across the electricity boards of the country today. Now, one more important challenge, the renewable source in India are majorly of two components. One is wind and other is solar. Now, there must be a question in our mind, why we are getting into solar? To me, thermal power plants are being you know, denied by international community not to add thermal generation into your grid. And hydro, I have no control because there's no water available as such. And almost we tapped most of them. And those has not been tapped. That will take at least a decade time to get it installed because of environmental clearances, construction of use dams, 
So there is no scope because we are all middle class Indians today aspiring to have actually at least two to three air conditions in our homes, including drawing rooms. So the energy requirement has gone up significantly. But the addition of energy resources has not happened the way we actually forecasted. So we need energy, no doubt about it, but it has to be quickly. So quick energy means there is only one source that is PV, which can be installed and completed the project within a year. And that is how to me, PV is good source, but also for India, it is a compulsion to get into actually PV energy sources to achieve huge installation within a short duration of time. Now, today, the overall PV renewable contribution, PV is contributing close to, uh, I mean, uh, <coughs> 24% and the wind is contributing close to 26%. Now, solar rooftop is a prime option in India to meet local demand at low voltage distribution systems because all the government buildings do have free rooftops because you cannot put your PV plants actually anywhere because space is a constraint, you know, and it is so expensive. No one can afford to give their land for actually solar installations, but the government rooftops are already available to us free of cost. So government initiated the program of putting rooftop solar across all the government building. So then we thought, why not IIT Roorkee campus can be considered as one of the option to do it. And fortunately, I've been given the assignment to have a strategic plan for renewable integrations. So today we have actually 2.73 megawatt of rooftop solar installation in the campus where the OPIC load requirement of the campus is close to 2.5 megawatt. During summer vacation, when all the students leave the campus, then the load drops drastically. And summer actually we have 95% of PV generation. And it so happened that because of excess load, excess generation and less load, the voltage observed at different laboratories and houses, they go as high as 260 to 274, which is dangerous. So then we have to address the next question that if your load is drastically less and which is going to happen when maximum PV penetration occurs, so the system voltage profile actually will oscillate significantly. So India's target to install 300 gigawatt of solar by 2030 means we are inviting maximum problem to this power grid and how to address become a challenge for all of us. Now solar rooftop system are rapidly getting integrated in the low voltage distribution network and hence voltage oscillations and hence challenges. So what is happening today? So there are two major problems you all might have seen. There are two major components today because of use PV installation and also randomly integrated to the distribution, distribution system. We all experience a over voltage fluctuation because the load is keep on oscillating. The generation is also keep on oscillating and there is no certainty what time, how much PV will be available to me. So all the distribution systems, low voltage distribution system experience a over voltage fluctuation. Now that may be due to low X by R ratio results in over voltage at the feeder ends due to higher penetration of solar photovoltaic generation in the low voltage networks. Now there is one more issue that I have already addressed during the beginning of the talk, unable to operate in islanded mode. That means when the grid is not there, those small low voltage networks unable to operate in islanded mode because the main grid is not visible to the grid. So most of the solar rooftop system operate in a grid feeding mode and it demands a strong utility support or potential voltage source to synchronize the inverters. When the inverter don't see the grid's availability, so then they stop generating. There is also one more common problem is being seen as unintended trip because all the switching of heavy loads create an instantaneous voltage overshoot in the low voltage network. And this triggers because of when you experience more than 245 to 247 volts, this triggers an unintended tripping of the inverter which resets and reboot itself. So there is an option to adjust, but most of the time because of this voltage fluctuation, the uh, 
the inverters actually trip frequently, which is not a good sign for efficient power system. So this is what actually the today's uh, rooftop solar network, and we expect in 20, uh, I mean, over a period of time, so this diagram has been drawn in 2017. So 2023, we see that there is a huge uh, injection of rooftop solar, uh, which is an important challenge. Now, the majority issue here, when you have maximum penetration from PV, so large scale solar integration creates a deficit in the rotational inertia of the system because these generations, when it is from 16% to 40% of injection, probably they will reduce my rotational devices because of PV injection power. So the inertia of the system will reduce over a period of time. And the system will be naturally vulnerable to sudden load changes and impact the frequency stability of the system, which lead to frequent blackouts. That means if there is a sudden change, sudden requirement, probably those PV generating park or units may not be able to contribute significantly in a very short span of time. And hence the system instability become frequent. So there is also a bit of power imbalance conflicting nature of solar and load profile will create a serious peak energy deficit because we have a load characteristic and we have seen that peak occurs in the you know late evening but the solar peak occurs in the day afternoon time so probably there is a mismatch or the conflicting between the real peak to the solar peak so you keep on adding solar means you are keep on increasing the peak which is not needed and the required peak at late evening is not supportive until unless you have a huge storage technology to take this energy during afternoon and discharge during evening hours. So what we are thinking basically at this stage, reducing the voltage fluctuation at point of common coupling in distribution network caused by large penetration of PV, harvesting maximum energy from PV through integration of distributed energy resource sources. And increasing the reliability of power supply in a weak distribution system and enhancing ancillary services to the conventional grid. Now, let us all understand putting a storage in a system is a solution naturally because your peak, load peak, and the PV peak they are different, and hence you have to store the energy and discharge during the required peak. So, to do that, it's a very, very expensive composition. So nobody will recommend to go for a huge gigawatt level storage technology across the country to evacuate uh, all the PV energy that is available to me in the country. So what we need to do, we need to extract some other properties from the battery storage. Probably it can operate in islanded mode of operation. It can provide a bit of ancillary services, which is not very common. So probably through this mechanism, we can justify the cost of the battery, which is not only uh, meeting out storing the energy, but it can also meet out bit of ancillary, some ancillary services in the network. So transforming the passive load voltage, low voltage distribution network into an active and controllable smart distribution grid. So when you talk about battery storages, uh, distributed energy storage feature, if you have a grid connected board, Active power balance during grid peak and off peak hours is possible. LVRT, low voltage ride through capabilities. Network voltage support is possible. And certainly power quality improvement in terms of good voltage profile and less power interruption is possible. It improves the reliability index of the network also. Now, when you move to islanded mode of operation, when the grid is not there, Active power balance with PV to meet the local demand is possible. Act as main power to critical load present in the network in the absence of PV during islanded mode of operation because the battery will act as a grid or a source of generation when the main grid is not there. It provides support to the network during faults. Act as critical source during network maintenance and restoration. Aid inertia to the system during abrupt load changes also. Now, let us get into the challenges. 
how this process initiated. First of all, we formulated the problem where we have taken actually IIT Roorkee campus as an example, which is uh, for the benefit of listeners. And IIT Roorkee campus is a seven to eight megawatt campus where the peak is close to eight megawatt and the off peak is close to 2.5 megawatt. And we have 2.73 megawatt of actually solar installation in the campus. So we do have both the challenges all the time. The PV energy are being observed by the or consumed by the campus itself. But during summer. Actually, we see a bit of voltage challenges, voltage issues because of extremely low loading conditions in the laboratories as well as in the hostel campuses. So what we need to do, we have modeled the whole IIT Rookie campus, which was not in order. The line resistance, line reactors, substation data, nothing was actually physically available. So we tried to gather it. So today we have the complete system with us. And because it is an academic campus and the objective is to do a bit of research, normally institutions do not deny to give the distribution system for carrying out experimentation. However, if I get into a distribution company, they will not allow the distribution system to be tested. So in the lab where actually I'm sitting today is the Admire lab where we have integrated this lab directly into the grid. And after the system modeling, once you create whole system of the campus, then you have to identify a solution method. That means we have to understand if I have to put some storage, what could be its magnitude? And what are the locations we are going to install? I'm sharing some of my practical experiences so that this technology can directly get into other academic campuses of this country where we most likely have 20 to 30 percent of PV cooked up solar available to us. So once you find the optimal solution for the locations and its magnitude, then we have to go for a bit of actually control and design solutions. So you need to have a test bed and where actually you can have some physical storage devices. Imagine I do have a megawatt scale system and I have to put a storage of 200 megawatt, 200 kilowatt battery. So it is next to impossible to integrate a 200 kilowatt battery into a laboratory test bed mechanism. So we can test it for 5 to 10 kilowatt. And then based on that simulation, we can conclude that these are the locations where if some physical storage has been integrated, I do not see any technical challenges when I go to the field. So what we have done actually based on the laboratory experimentation, we have physically installed based on the outcome of this lab experimentation. We have physically installed batteries for almost last two years. And so and there are two storage mechanism. One is two and two and a half years old. The other is just actually three months old. And fortunately, they are functioning, operating very smoothly. Now the last one is actually basically the field deployment. So first we do the problem formulation. Second, we talk about solution methodology. Third, actually we talk about laboratory test bed and modeling. And fourth, actually we go to the field deployment for installation of the batteries. So these are all physical batteries which has been installed in the campus as of now. So what are the major challenges? The biggest challenges today for anyone to take a decision before installing the battery, what we do, we have some money. We say, OK, take this money, give me a battery and put it. But nobody knows where to put, how to put and what about its magnitude because we don't do any techno economic study as of now. So distribution companies does not encourage practical testing and deployment because no one will give you a system to test. And because the system is not available to you, whatever decision you take is not going to be optimal. So deployment of distributed energy sources to address the issue related to PV penetration in low voltage distribution network become a challenge. Real time simulation in the laboratory may not replicate the megawatt scale practical scenarios. Let's say if I do some research with 10 kilowatt battery and make it actually, uh, uh, you know, like 500 uh, kilowatt of battery in the field. So it is not necessarily the confusion that I've derived is going to work when you go to the real time. Now, there is one more challenge I could see that is high capital cost of battery energy storage system and the capacity degradation over time and use. Uh, that is an important target. We need to also understand the lack of, uh, you know, the kind of degradation models, how the battery is going to underperform 
over a period of time. And those also need to be kept in mind before taking such decisions. High capacity cost of solar rooftop integration to low voltage distribution network become an issue. So what we need to do actually solution utilizing government institutions and distribution network. So always use campus network for your research. But here one challenge like I'm very happy to inform all of you that when I requested my director to give a grid for testing, uh, I mean, you know, it's very risky. OK, you cannot give the grid to anyone for testing. But somehow actually he was kind. He said, OK, do it, but don't make to make sure that the campus is not burning. So that way actually probably it is possible today. So this is how the IIT Roki distribution network look like. So there are 21 uh, substations and load demand as I told you it is varying between 6 to 8 megawatt. And the minimum is close to 2 to 2.5 megawatt. And we have 2.7 megawatt of PV installation at 35 different locations. And all the distribution system is undergrounded. And we have RTUs in all the substations. And SCADA system actually is in place. Very soon it will be in, in active mode. Frequent tripping of solar system due to over voltage, which has been experienced in this campus. Because the scenario of PV integration to different system, different load condition will behave differently. So we need to repeat this exercise before taking serious attempt to invest on storage in any academic campuses. Now it is a very interesting diagram where it shows the campus network. This is our campus network and very importantly what we have derived is that actually there are five locations which has been identified. So you can just have a look. So this is could you see a battery here? Can you, all of you see a battery? In the corner where my rotating my cursor. Uh, I can't see your cursor basically. Uh, I, I, could you see the cursor now? No. Uh, if you see the right corner, right corner, because there are 33 kV bus on the top, followed by two substations, 33 by 11 kV, and they are being actually radially distributed. But if you see there is a battery location which look like a black box with two orange strips on the top. So these are the rooftop solar locations across the distribution system. And these are one, two, three, four, and five. There are five battery locations. One is uh, very close to bus number one, end of bus number one. Could you see the bus number one? Yes, yes. Yeah, this one. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, yeah, okay. And at the extreme, you can see there is a battery. Okay. Yeah, then yeah, move yeah. To right. Bus number two. In the extreme, you can see another battery. Right. And then uh, you can also see bus number nine, bus number fifteen. So these are the five battery locations we have identified through our now local. Now we see your cursor. Now I see yeah. your cursor. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Thank you. So what I wanted to. Uh, emphasize that we have carried out this research for our own campus by simulating the whole distribution system in real time. So that is uh, something actually I like to emphasize here where the five important locations have been identified and their magnitudes are also being identified. And then we have gone to the real time for deployment. So as and when budget is available, we keep on spending some amount on batteries. OK. So this is how the campus looks like. So this is our campus network, a uh, campus uh, geography basically. And these are the rooftop uh, solars, 2.73 megawatt at 35 locations. And you will be also happy to know that we have almost smart meter everywhere in the substations. And there are two different uh, batteries which are physically present today. The first one is in the electrical engineering department, which is just below my lab where I'm now giving my talk. Uh, I mean, this has been supported uh, through a collaboration. We have, I mean, because this is through industry collaboration. So ABB uh, gave that money to our uh, laboratory or the institute uh, with a condition that we'll exchange some of our technology and they will give that cost freely. So around three, three crores they have contributed three to four crores to the campus after being convinced with our uh, research in the laboratory. 
So what we do actually, there are total load of uh, 111 kilowatt and the rooftop solar is close to 70 kilowatt. And we have now connected battery, which is close to 200 kilowatt hour. Now, if you look at the configuration, so this is our electrical engineering department and we have the battery. So the electrical energy, electrical engineer department can get energy from the main grid. It can get the energy from the diesel generator. It can get the energy from the rooftop. It can also get the energy from the PV, sorry, storage devices. So out of diesel generator, battery, rooftop solar, and the main grid, this department can be catered. But the 111 kilowatt of load requirement, we can meet optimally become an issue. So my main target is to evacuate all the powers through rooftop solar PV, consume it properly, and rest of the amount actually I can take it from my main grid. And during off peak hours, those PV energy can be stored in the battery and maybe discharged during off peak hours. Now similarly, so you could see the physical uh, ABB uh, battery in the campus, which is uh, close to 200 kilowatt hour lithium ion. And this is a detailed uh, line diagram of the campus. As you could see, close to 2.678 megawatt of PV at 35 different locations. And then during the process of analysis, we have tried to capture different load profiles of hostels, departments, and residential areas, how they behave during different seasons, like spring, summer, and autumn. And that has helped us to derive uh, you know, an optimization equation and solve it to an extent so that my battery storage can be used optimally. So this is one of the diagram where we have measured the maximum and minimum voltage at a particular substation. And it is very surprising to see that one per unit voltage means that is close to 230 volt single phase. And may, most of the times we experience that the voltage is more than one per unit. And especially in few cases, it is even more than 1.05, which is not acceptable. So we feel that this is due to maximum PV penetration to the grid during low voltage, sorry, low loading network, and that become a challenge. So what we have done, basically, we have tried to understand how the load is keep on varying from the left hand side diagram. You can see during spring, summer and autumn. So this is my 24 hours load characteristics. And these are my actually 24 hours PV characteristics. And as you could see, the PV characteristic peak is not necessarily the peak of my load characteristic, excluding during autumn. OK. So through optimization techniques, I am not getting into too much details, but through certain optimal power flow mechanism, we could understand that, you know, uh, the important locations where the battery need to be integrated. So once the locations are being identified, then we have burned the grid into the simulator. And the battery, which has been connected to the simulator through a power just to validate, for example, if I have to put actually 100 kilowatt hour of battery at this location, so I will take a percentage of that amount of storage in physical mode, <coughs> and rest of them will be simulated person. So once I carry out the simulation, I go to the field and put the real amount of physical devices integration. So through this mechanism, we understood what are the locations where the battery need to be installed, and first location was electrical engineering department. And then we thought the second location, which is just adjacent to electrical engineering department, that is our old humanities building. And today it is known as School of Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. And fortunately, I was heading that school actually after my dean of academic positions. So I thought, why not there is a battery? Fortunately, the location which has been identified by our scholars matching to that same school. 
So we have electrical engineer department and school of artificial intelligence. Both are actually just divided through a road, so they're next to each other. So we have created a microgrid there with 274 kilowatt hour. We created one more microgrid with 150 kilowatt hour storage. And now these two microgrids are operating independently. But in future, we see that they can exchange information and carry out optimal storage and discharge technologies. Okay, so this is how the new uh, camp, the School of Artificial Intelligence network look like. As you could see, there is a battery, the red box, and we can see that there's a 150 kilowatt hour battery is currently being installed. So this is another scenario because you know every location will have a different configurations. Now here you see the total load is 70 kilowatt only, and the rooftop solar is 96 kilowatt. What does it mean? All the time, whatever the amount of energy that I generate from my PV from the rooftop cannot be consumed at any given point of time. So that need to be stored. So there is a mandatory requirement here the battery storage is a great option to store all those generations that are available to me, which is much higher than the consumption loads. So this is the new setup at School of AI, and the previous one is in the Department of Electrical Engineering. So this is what actually we expect our central uh, energy management uh, system look like, CMS. And we will be connecting to the grid, digital generators, loads, and command to battery control centers. So with, with different time, we can simulate and we can instruct the batteries now how much to charge and how much to discharge at a given loading conditions. And we also found, you know, there are we have plotted some, these are the real time characteristics as you could see. One is kilowatt. So the main active power output to the green color, you can see how the battery is behaving and the state of charge of the battery also can be measured from time to time. And these characteristics can be changed based on our instruction considering the requirements. So finally, the integration of uh, DS with SCADA and Central Energy Management Center will look like this. So we'll have a SCADA center. So we'll have a command center. This is the laboratory and this is the institute property. And these are the batteries. So we expect five batteries in the next two, three years time. And then the centrally we can control or optimally we can operate those batteries to charge and discharge depending upon our requirements. So what exactly we have achieved by doing this research? Applicable to low voltage distribution network with uh, rooftop PV installations, interoperability of microgrids in the distribution system improves the reliability of supply to the local consumers. Use of battery energy storage systems as backup and development of technologies to maintain uninterrupted power supply. And energy storage deployment will play a crucial role in achieving India's target of 280 gigawatt of PV installation, 280 gigawatt of PV. When we inject, we could see the challenges for sure, and we must be well prepared in advance how to observe those PV energy to my grid without having crisis. So what is our future scope? The future scope is very interesting. So tomorrow we'll have millions of microgrids similar to structure where you will PV, we'll have batteries, we'll have buildings, we'll have consumers, digital generator, main grid, everything will be there. So tomorrow we'll have IIT Bhubaneswar as a campus, SO as a campus, IMT as a campus. Every campus become a microgrid. Now the target is, imagine I do have a peak deficit of close to 1%. What does it mean? If there is a peak deficit during that hour, 1% of the nation is not getting electricity. Means if there are, uh, you know, 100 lakh villages, so 1 lakh village will not get electricity during that hour. Now, can all the microgrids, can all the batteries of my network start discharging during that hour? so that one lakh villages will get electricity and not fall under peak energy deficit scenario. 
So to do that, there is a coordinating approach between the microgrid to come together and act upon. So to do that research, actually, we have created two microgrids. Now we are thinking of connecting them and exchanging information so that one microgrid support to the other one. For an example, this battery, which is there at electrical engineering department, can supply the load of school of AI and vice versa. So that is what actually the final aim is all about. So with this note, I'll just conclude my talk by giving a bit of future scope. Data analysis and model based scheduling of distribution grid is an important area. Economic scheduling of multi microgrids for efficient operation, how they can cooperate each other or become more efficient. And the future distribution network will have several connected microgrids which are required to be operated as fully independent and controllable entities as per the grid regulations. The low voltage distribution network are reconfigurable and after storage integration, a reliability analysis can be carried out. So with this note, I conclude my talk and thank you very much for your attention and patient listening. Oh, thank you, Dr. Padi, for your uh, excellent lecture and practical work that what you have done really in IIT Rurki in creating microgrid and also trying to integrate it so that actually the uh, the energy requirement from the uh, you know uh, grid could be reduced and you can very easily utilize the solar energy that is available now actually i will request if there are any questions to be asked to dr padi sanat kumar ji uh, you like yes, to yeah, uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear okay. you loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, not that I understood everything of it, but <laughs> nevertheless, it was very good. But as a layman, purely in your uh, field, I would like to ask two questions or yes. related question. You see, you seem to be blessed because yes. you are generating more than what is required. This is fantastic. <laughs> Is not normally we are always shocked only. Now, I also saw from your photographs that your solar panels are all fixed. They are not following the sun. They are not uh, designed to do that. They are kept in the correct angle and they are fixed. My question is, whenever your generation is much more than what you are, are you not able to shade some of the panels? In other words, you create a, a thing. You know, a Wimbledon tennis court, when rain comes, they put a cover on top. Something like that. It needs to be motorized and probably something you have to do and uh, automatic, wagera, wagera, wagera. But is it a possibility that you reduce generation by means of reducing solar insulation? Thank you. Okay. I think uh, I'll just suggest two things here. The generation is not more than load. The generation is much, much, especially the PV generation in the campus is much lesser than the load because the maximum PV generation could be 2.65, that is 2.7 megawatt. However, the load is close to seven, six to eight megawatt. So the generation is always less than this, but no, in sir, summer, your people are going away on holidays, you know, so your generation at that time, that's what you were saying. Generation yes, at that time is more. Yes, I'm talking yes. about that area. Yeah, so only, only during summer vacation, when all the campus goes away, there is no one is there to consume your energy. But the PV is generous enough to give you 2.73. So that is where actually we have challenges. So there, there are two ways you suggested you can move from the MPPT mode, that, that, that means don't take all the energy which is available to you. Okay, you can treat some of the inverters also. The second option is, why to waste your energy? Why don't we store it? So my solution here, instead of wasting renewable energy is not a good option. We must optimally store them and use during evening peak where the country uh, is suffering with the peak energy deficit. That's okay, okay. Oh. 
yeah but uh, you are all i thought you were explaining sometimes that the pv your uh, pv uh, the batteries are not able to supply at the time you want you want uh, several grids and then one fellow supplying the other fellow like that it seemed to be a little bit complicated so i was thinking whether this is possible that is certainly a motorized option is always there but the question is that is too expensive <laughs> and very difficult to maintain yeah. for a distance long to go that's in true, open sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think true. now to me, a fixed battery, a fixed PV with a battery could be a good solution. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Dr. Pradeep, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much, Professor Padi. Uh, I am not an expert, but we have been talking about smart grids for a long time. I am. I want to. I have two questions. One, where are we in India with respect to making grids smarter, more reliable, and integrate actually renewable energy so that we can take advantage of? And the second question is, uh, for example, in Australia. Uh, I mean, such huge battery storage system has been put. In fact, I now forget the, I think South Australia, where they are saying that uh, everything is integrated and things like that. So I would like your comments, like whether they are utilizing uh, and optimizing everything in real time. And second question is, which is very relevant for Indian condition, is the uh, cost. Because my understanding is that Indian uh, uh, grid system, tariffs, it is very complicated system. And uh, who will bear the cost that is always there? And right now, there is, right now, I am in Maharashtra, for example, there is a big controversy about smart meters and so on and so forth. So I would like your uh, expert opinion on all these issues. Absolutely, yeah. So I'll just give you a uh, very simple uh, uh, I mean, comments, basically, not to make it too complicated, because most of the time we technocrats make the comments so complicated, which is not being understood by decision makers, policy makers, and normal human beings. Okay. See, one thing is very common. We are aggressive in consuming electricity. Right. Because when I was a young boy, I still remember <laughs> my father used to say sub I mean, you know, everyone can sleep in a single room so that the electricity will be safe. So right. I still remember four to five person, one fan, even though we had different bedrooms with different fans <laughs> that have no air conditioning, but used to spend a lot of time in the common space so that the electricity will be safe. But today that concept has gone. We become so aggressive. Even we do store to air conditioning, one for the guest rooms, one for the drawing rooms, where probably two to three days in a month, probably we may be using the air conditioning. And our kids become so relaxed when they come out. I still remember when we come out of the study room, you have to switch off the fan. That is the rule. But today you need not even switch off your air conditioners. And it is the father who will go and switch off all the ACs. <laughs> so now my solution here, because of the huge consumption of electricity, because that we cannot stop. We need to be aggressive. Let, let it be. Let us live naturally. But because of the consumption increase, we need to have huge installation which is next to impossible in next five to 10 years time through a proper hydro or thermal project or a nuclear project. So to me, naturally or indirectly, we are not into PV, but we are forced to get into PV so that quickly we can add generations. Now the biggest surprise or I can say gift to us that we are very hungry, our network is very hungry. And whatever the PV energy available to me, I'm ready to consume it. But when we do it for next 10 years time, then probably 40 to 50% of PV installation in the grid will be there. So there are two challenges, as we know everyone about the system stability and the inertia. But irrespective of that, the amount of energy which will be available to me during off-peak hours I really do not know what I'm going to do. For a small system, it is 5 to 10% excess. But for a 50% PV integrated systems, 
the excess energy during afternoon hour will be used. So that energy need to be stored. So we need to develop indigenous technology today for all the campus to be self-sustainable, to consume their own energy, whatever available to them, because not using renewable, to me, it is a crime because you invested crores of rupees, you got those energy, and now you're not using it. So That's this is one of the solutions, probably we are into it, where locally, actually, we can optimize our sources, store it, and give to the grid back during peak hours. But I do have a long-term vision in next 10, 15 years. If you can connect all these smaller campuses, let's say there are five campuses, and five of them actually will consume in an optimal way and discharge in an optimal way so that those villages are not getting any electricity today due to curtailment can be reduced drastically. So I have a social impact in a long vision to come. Yeah, uh, so so that I got it. Uh, that was very clear that you have to. The challenge is, first of all, what I could understand from your talk is that where to install the microgrid, that is also a challenge, right? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, whole India, let us say, I mean, in fact, our international solar mission is even talking about one world, one solar and all that. So the question is, for example, all abandoned coal mines, now we convert them to microgrids, let us say, uh, renewable microgrids with, let us say, storage. Then the, uh, the, this modeling has to be done, whether if we convert them to this, would that be optimal or is that an issue? Feasible. Is it feasible to really do it? Because Correct. my argument today, what is happening, because yes. we put all the renewables or the PV panels as mm. and when we feel like there is no control, there is no strategy. Correct. Why Correct. we are not suffering? Because we are hungry. The grid mm. can observe all the energies. But Correct. that is not going to work the moment we cross 30% plus. After 30% mm. plus, this becomes Correct. a new challenge. So I think right. we must be well prepared ahead of time where if those integrations become a challenge, so that time government will say, no, you have to show me the proof, where are the location, where you have to integrate those. So that time mm -hmm. actually we will not be having technology. So we'll go to the neighboring countries and buy technology mm -hmm. and do it. So my mm -hmm. suggestion is let us be, be prepared to that, which is going to okay. come. That is number one. So integration. Right. And number two, storage is going to be mandatory in any form. Probably it is a hydrogen or... Uh, flywheel or maybe battery yeah, right. of any chemistry that is also mandatory okay and uh, because i was just mentioning you no know, god is not very kind so if you are going mm -hmm. for pv or wind we have to store it because they're not happening uh, the time when i need actually or when we need so probably storage is also mandatory but because it is a costly device instead of putting random storages again let's say i do have yeah. 100 kilowatt of pv and i put a battery of 100 kilowatt also to store it which is not mm -hmm. practical I have to calculate whether it's 20, 30. So can I design the magnitude to save my money? And can I design the location to optimally utilize it? And can I design my optimal location for the integration also? So it is a package for a small village microgrid or a campus microgrid. We need to undergo these steps to make it feasible. And we have experimented at IIT Roorkee campus to my best knowledge. I mean, uh, probably actually this is the campus where, you know, the academic campus become truly smart for some extent and probably the same exercise being repeated at all the campuses of the country probably we all benefit by exchanging our knowledge and understanding so that is a simple thought process and i am assuming that your model is scalable that means oh, even absolutely. if there are one million uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. yes 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 yeah. yes Yes. So, so I think it, it should be scaled up. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I agree completely. I support. And yeah. what needs to be done, you are the best person to kind of and uh, impress on the powers that be, that it can be scaled up and yes. tested yes. so that we yes. are uh, well prepared. Yeah, Correct. thank you. And also just to add one small thing, though, because this lecture is limited to the campus grid, so what I'm doing now, actually, I am now trying to burn the whole Indian grid at 400 kV level to my simulator. 
and capturing the 400 uh, kv substation of haridwar which is also a simulated version then slowly coming from haridwar substation to rurki campus and from the rurki campus the physical 200 kilowatt physical device rest all are simulated and then trying to understand actually what kind of scenario this lesson will have in next 10 50 years 15 years to come so that kind of use simulation also we are foreseeing that whether this country is certainly there will be a challenge no doubt about it but in what magnitude and where a well ahead of time thank you my pleasure sir sir i have a uh, addition i have an additional comment yeah, uh, yes, a, ter a terminology which i forgot to tell you we call it load following so our generation is supposed to be load following in our uh, system nuclear reactors it is not possible <laughs> we are we are that's why we say we will do base load so that we don't have to, we, it's not very easy to take make because it's too huge to make it a low load following so this is the terminology that we use so i was thinking along the same lines whether your generation could be load following that's all thank you correct thank you any other question <coughs> i i have so one question have some question yes please hello uh, regarding the sto energy storage device the battery looks to be very costly and life is limited how about the super capacitor technology to store energy where it is now i think sir there are there is a huge difference between super capacitor applications and battery applications i think super super capacitor is a very transient phenomena and for a short span of time they can support your grid but they cannot do throughout the day as and when you need so super capacitor first of all the size become an issue having such a huge super capacitors and even be the laboratory scale be experiment but to my understanding i think super capacitor as of now i don't see any future for huge storage devices thank you so dr badpanda please yeah it is a good uh, lecture but i just wanted to know uh, is it possible for you even at iit roorkee to supplement your solar energy with some other renewable sources of energy to match it to the load demand and only remaining very few should be supported by the battery as you know the battery is going to be costly in all forms and has got so much other negativity so i feel that or at least the all renewable sources should have alternate alternate one to backup looking at the regional conditions and all those so that backup may be very helpful it may be also economically viable if you can, let's say you back a solar with a wind or solar with some other in the local area then give remaining to the uh, to the battery or any other things so absolutely thank you very much to me the cost of battery is very very expensive i will not recommend this is a solution or replacement to the current system but we look at the previous scenario of ups probably 50% of the residences across the country had ups at a given point of time for storing the energy and discharging during power failures of 1 to 2 hours in a day so that means battery was not a new terminology to this nation as of now it is a hugely utilized let us say battery through ups mechanism almost every alternate house in any city or probably almost all the houses in metros had a ups mechanism for backup so battery indirectly without mentioning battery actually we were using batteries for our energy storage so that is expensive if you see that way but today for the renewable integration i think storage need to be integrated for better utilization of the pv there are two way of doing it either you put it with a very small percentage and directly consume it so that there is no battery mechanism however if you are become extremely aggressive let's say 1 megawatt power 5 mm -hmm. megawatt power if it is being observed by the grid from the characteristic that i have shown 
it is not necessary such a huge amount will be observed by the grid all the time especially in 2030 so to me if you are very aggressive with pv probably we need to think parallelly the storage devices not necessarily lithium ion or any other battery but some storage technology need to be integrated without fail okay i have one more query in my mind as you said that normally inverters are, are synchronized to the grid but when you say the grid is fail but i can have a backup eps to track it i can this days power outages has gone has gone a long way so when i find the grid failure the one which happened in 2012 or whatever so if i find grid failure i can instantly switch over to my another source which is backup and that backup can be used for synchronizing the remaining part the remaining solar systems probably that is feasible or not feasible i digital, you talk about digital generator Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, what actually for you you that said during the is power failure one in 2012, that grid failure. So you are all backup system. They could not be sync. They has to be shut down just because there is no nothing, uh, no source to synchronize. Normally, they synchronize with the grid. I understand that. But if grid failure, we can send that grid and put up another EPS to generate a reference source to which all all your solar panels or any other internal panels can track. if it is i don't know practically it appears to me it is feasible but whether it is practically done or not i really do not know but it can be feasible it seems see the biggest challenge in 2012 when we experienced blackout all our renewable rooftop solar panels could not get isolated from the grid that is for sure because we had no isolation mechanism as of now but today with this battery integration okay even not having a diesel generator in place you can certainly get isolated from the main grid and provide a reasonable amount of power for a day or two so that is what actually we can see additional advantage of the storage technology otherwise if you only use it for storage probably that is not going to be very economical okay okay thank you soni ji namaskar नमस्कार नमस्कार सर एक्सीलेंट टॉक पड़ी सर नो प्रोफेसर सो आई वाज जस्ट वंडरिंग यू नो हाउ कैन दिस टॉक बी इट विल रिमेन इनकंप्लीट अनलेस यू थ्रो सम लाइट ऑन द रोल ऑफ डीएसओ एज वी स्केल अप फॉर द कंट्री आई नो यू आर एन एक्सपर्ट इन दैट एरिया आल्सो हाउ दीस टू थिंग्स मैच अप थैंक यू आई थिंक डीएसओ प्रोबब्ली यू नो टू मी because they will not spend money for batteries for sure that is something i think today we are able to do it because we have bit of institutional support because bit of sponsorship for example the two batteries which are in operation i never thought that i'll be able to put a battery in my campus but due to bit of government support bit of csr funding from abb we are able to do it but why a dso will spend actually 5 crores rupees for 300 kilowatt hour installation i mean which is to me actually slightly questionable but if you have to do probably what they can do not completely but a percentage of battery they can do and maybe a cheaper solution of storage so i think probably that could be an issue but for a dso they will not encourage uh, huge storage devices to be installed because that will not really fit into the economics but this technology is mandatory sir we need to be prepared for this technology because we do not know what scenario we are heading to and the cost is drastically dropped by 50% in last 4 years so who knows that even in next 10 years time it will be 1/10 of the cost so probably dso may see a solution may see a solution and maybe uh, instead of going for a diesel if there is a huge penalty because battery is also not a green power that is for sure so that we need to understand but for a campus actually i was thinking of further for example hmm. our critical installations like say hmm. hospitals or uh, yes. police centers you know they also can avoid the diesels and go for this anyway but i i get your point thank you so much that's right that's right. thank you thank you so i find actually Professor Sipat Kalun Karmulkar is uh, director of IIT Bhubaneswar. Is here. Would you yes. like to ask something, sir? 
Yes, yes. I had a question, but it was asked one of the last questions, uh, slightly in a different form. That what are the challenges of? Uh, because my area is uh, semiconductor devices, and I found this lecture very interesting because it's not my area. So I'm asking question <laughs> from that perspective. So if, if you have to integrate uh, different types of sources, uh, like wind energy, gas turbine, uh, solar, and uh, so on, on the grid, uh, is there any significant challenge? or uh, you know the model of these sources will be different right yes i think thank you professor uh, karmalkar actually very nice meeting you i heard a lot about you today i'm meeting in you through an online board i will give a very beautiful example in iit palakkad today they do have actually a bit of opportunity for wind they have a bit of opportunity for pv and they are also interested to invest on solar so probably iit palakkad campus is looking for a combination of multiple sources integrated with actually renewables and catering the whole campus at least 60% of the load requirement in next 10 years time but this is not true in all the campuses because even though i wish to integrate wind i cannot integrate because this is geographically related but if you have multiple sources to be integrated at laboratory scale this is possible but in practical field if it is available it is certainly can be integrated without fail it is possible to integrate the answer is yes but it depending upon the availability but the mix the right mix is always a question the right mix is always a question because both the peak of wind and pv they appear at two different time one is at midnight yeah. 12 the other is actually daytime 12 Correct. so and then the storage so that mix need to be i mean modeled and uh, carried out hardware testing before we Sorry. go for execution Thank you. So, Professor Padi, I am not an electrical engineer, so I will not be able to really comment on all these things. But I found your thing is very interesting. But I have got another uh, question, related question. The related question is now, India is actually committed to make by 2070 totally actually uh, carbon neutral. That means actually we will stop using fossil fuels of any form. So the only thing, also there is one more problem, particularly some of the industries which are very, very energy intensive, like let us say steel, fertilizer, cement, etc. Can let us say solar supply power to them? Or will it be possible that we produce actually green hydrogen and green hydrogen could be really used for actually powering these uh, industries? I think that is actually big challenge. So would you like to throw some light on this? Actually, uh, please don't take it otherwise. It's my personal opinion to me. India as a country, looking at the aggression in next 10 to 15 years time, we should go for nuclear power plants for sure. PV is going to be a ad hoc solution, but this cannot cater to thousands of gigawatt of energy of this country. So that is not a good solution because one day we will crash. So we need to have inertial systems, but thermal, if it is not there, hydro, we can tap whatever maximum possible. But having a bit of nuclear as a replacement to thermal, along with a bit of PV, probably a good solution. Because we cannot have a system which is purely renewable for such huge system, which is, to me, it is not acceptable. We can get into renewable for some extent, but maybe 30%, 35%, 40%. But 60% should come from thermal and hydro. If the thermal is not available, we should go for nuclear. For sure. But but what is happening in actually in Europe? They are trying to now close actually all nuclear power plants. Sir, actually in Europe, actually their demand is actually extremely less compared to our demand because they are actually small units actually having a lot of resources and they all have actually nuclear power also in place. So we do not have nuclear power. So thermal need to be closed. 
but they all cannot be replaced by PV because it is not really reliable. I just say, well, uh, my personal guess, press professor. No, no, it's okay. That is uh -huh. yeah. Now yeah. I can appreciate actually this point that we should go for more nuclear yes. to the extent that is possible. That is possible. It's possible the storage problem that which you are really talking of. Yeah. Also, the storage cost is likely to come down yes. because of actually some of the lithium deposits actually that we have found in our country itself. So okay. things will be possibly will really improve. Yeah, I think we can do it. But at the same time, we have to think of also, because now they are talking of actually transporting green hydrogen and green that ammonia is... through pipeline. So and this thing has to be really created using yeah. the water only. And possibly yeah. this, uh, you know, the so-called uh, photovoltaic cells will be now actually in the sea, not actually in the uh, that, that. Lent. Yeah. I think that also option could be yeah. possible. Hydrogen anyway. is a solution. Yeah. Hydrogen is a solution. Uh, uh, yeah. No, hydrogen. Hydro also, we do, do not have enough of capacity so far as hydro is concerned. And only only the hydro capacities are located in the Himalayas region. Not much of actually in the plains. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous. I will tell you what is the problem with hydrogen to me. When you're talking about trucks being replaced by hydrogen trucks, okay? And the way we drive, the way we in discipline way we operate. <laughs> so I'm very nervous actually, you know, on highway what will happen. So that no, is no, my I, worry. I, I think yeah. the technology will improve. And <laughs> we have to really think of that way. Yes, yes. Anyway, that is a, a you know, debatable but, but issue. But as you have mentioned, I think hydrogen is a future, PV is a future, wind, offshore wind is a future, but they can only meet 40 to 50 percent maximum altogether. And rest 50 percent become a question because most of the hydropower project today, sir, stopped operating with 70 percent of its rating. You know. So I think that is another challenge we see. All our hydropower projects has gone down. So we need to have a bit of actually nuclear backup because suddenly if something goes wrong, where our new generation will survive. So as steel plants, you concern industry, a bit of nuclear combination with other renewables is fantastic. No, no, definitely I agree with your point that we should actually focus more on you know, nuclear than and what is happening in Europe or few other countries. We need not really worry because our problems are actually much more, much bigger than very... what problems they have. Absolutely. So, uh, sir, so now... Uh, there's a, a problem with uh, this uh, hydrogen, that uh, green hydrogen that Dr. Acharya was talking about, is like this. Hydrogen can be used as an energy carrier, like you carry wire uh, electricity along wires. Hydrogen can be carried on tubes, as you're saying. But yes, basically, yes. basically, the energy that you produce, put in to generate that hydrogen is more than what you will get out of the hydrogen when you burn it. So essentially, it is a loss-loss situation. <laughs> so small areas, probably you can have hydrogen uh, transmission. But in my opinion, it is not a very, you know, if you do an energy balance, the hydrogen system may not work out very well. This is my idea. Thank you. No, no. I, I definitely agree with you that this is actually, from an energy balance point of view, we cannot really think of. But possibly, given situation of our type, we have to also depend on this source of thing. So, for example, now in Canada, they are trying to actually run a steel plant using hydrogen as the fuel. And the technology has actually come up that hydrogen could be really used for, you know, even the steel production, steel melting and reduction, all these things is actually possible. But anyway, that is a debatable thing in long future, not necessarily the thing of today. Now, if there is no other question, after this excellent uh, lecture and so many questions, I will now request Professor Ganapati Panda, who is here, to please propose a vote of thanks 
for Dr. Padi. So, sir, Panda, please. No, you are not mute. You can speak. He is in fact in NIT Raipur. From there, he is actually joining. Okay. Yes, so I got an opportunity to give some concluding remarks. Let me thank Professor Naran Prasad Party for his valuable and informative talk on the emerging area of power engine. In fact, they have got a very big massive project. The concept what they presented, they are going to implement at NIT Jaipur, where he is the current director. His talk was really very simple, informative, and very interesting too. Three things one has to learn as a common person, but his greed, what is smart greed, and to the smart greed, various types of sources of AC energy are connected. When renewable energy is connected to the same grid, there are many challenging issues. Lot of decision, spontaneous decision are required. Control is required. Synchronization is required. And today, because of pollution control, because of environmental control, our alternative energy has become very much essential. Government is paying a lot of interest, a lot of money, investment, how renewable energy should be produced. And then obviously it is to be integrated to the great so-called smart grid, because in India till today, the smart grid concept has not fully been utilized. I think they are implementation in prototype model and actually Jaipur will help India to go to real life situation. Integration of so many things has to be there, particularly intelligent control, intelligent decision making using machine deep learning and artificial intelligence synchronization real time is very, very important. The question session was also very interesting. And a lot of typical questions were asked, which I was hearing. Of course, today I am in NIT Raipur, I have come for some work, and therefore there was non-synchronization. I am thankful to Professor Pari, who on our request from INA Bonister side, he has agreed to our request. And I hope in future will be more associated in our day-to-day -day activities. And the people who ask questions, the people participate particularly the SOE University in which Professor Acharya is there, who has already arranged many illuminated talk about 25 and going to be more in future. 
I am really thankful to SO University, specifically Professor Achazio and the President of SO University, as well as I am MT also associated in this particular joint program. Finally, I thank all the people who participated actively in this particular program and special thank to Professor Party and Professor Achazio. Thank you, all of you. Oh, thank, thank you, Professor Pandal. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to mention two things. First of all, Professor Padi, as a token of appreciation from INA Bhubaneswar chapter, we will send you a token yeah, gift. So. And that Hopefully. you will receive it very soon. The second thing, actually, what I would like to say, you are very much a part of our uh, INA uh, Human Resource Center. We are yes, yes, organizing yes, our uh, your national your convention yes, here yes, in Soa. Particularly on the application of artificial intelligence and decision making relating to smart grid, particularly for renewable energy. When they are connected, many issues has to be resolved, and I can contribute to it. Thank you. Anyway, what I would like to request you that from 9th to 11th of December, we will be having our annual convention here. Please make it a point actually to attend. And one more thing which I would like to mention that in this week itself, we will have the 29th distinguished lecture. And this will be from 7, 7 to 8.30 p.m. in the evening, and it will be given by Dr. Menon, who is actually USA best. And it will be something related to the flight control. And it, will, it is going to be a very, very interesting thing because he has also designed, you know, the flight control system for our uh, the satellites and the slow things that whatever it is being done. So please do attend and the link will definitely be sent to you. And thank you very much from the core of my heart that we had a very excellent lecture. And also the participants, they were more interested and they were really very, very enthusiastic to participate. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank you. And one small, small statement I like to share before leaving. I feel very humbled. Uh, yes. I mean, very humbled and very motivated by looking at, uh, you know, Sony ji, Sanat Kumar ji, yourself, Ganapati Panda ji, Professor Ka Karmal Kar ji, and almost all of you, you know, kind of a motivation to me to drive myself for next 10 years before my retirement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.